Hey, I'm Brandon, the online campus pastor here at Big Valley Grace, and thank you for taking a moment to watch this message. It is the teaching portion from one of our live weekend worship gatherings, and we have those every single weekend here online and in person. And I just want to extend an invitation to you to join us. We're just a local church, local body of believers, and we would love if you would join us uh, on a weekend upcoming here sometime soon. Uh, but as we get headed into this message together, a couple things just want to point you to. One is a connect card. If there's any way that, that we can pray for you, if you want to contact us, that connect card form is just a really great way uh, to let us know that you're joining us. Any next steps you want to take, stuff like that is right on there. Also, if you want to bring in offering, uh, worshipful gift uh, to King Jesus, you can do that right on our give page on our website or via text. So hope you enjoy the unpacking, the unfolding of the word as we look at it together. Welcome to Big Valley Grace Community Church. Welcome to everybody who's right here in the Welcome Center on the Modesto campus. It's good to see you. And welcome to everybody who's joining us live right now on our online campus. And you can see me, but I can't see you. I just want to invite you to come in person. We'd love to have you be with us as we worship the Lord together. And last week, we affirmed our elders. And I want to report back that our elders were affirmed. Two new elders and one elder was reaffirmed. And so thank you. Thank you for participating in that very important process as a church family that sets up our Board of Elders team for the ministry year, and so we're rejoicing in that. Um, coming up here in February and March, we're going to head into a new series. I want to share a little bit about it right now and invite you to be a part. The series is called Built to Last. It comes from Ephesians 4, the theme, and the tagline is equipping faith that is built to last in a decaying culture. And I don't think I have to work very hard to convince anyone of how our culture is decaying. It is seen in every environment. And it is a rapid decay that is occurring. And as we think about heading into the project that we're going to be going into, where we're going to provide ministry space for children and students with the new building, the theme that I wanted to attach to that is that we would equip faith that is built to last in a decaying culture, because that's the type of faith we want to invest into our kids, we want to invest into students. We want to invest into their parents, into families as a church. And so we're really excited. My wife and I are very excited to participate in this with our entire church family. And I just want to extend an invitation. Be here. Be here together with the church family in February and March as we head into our new series together. Well, we're currently in a series called Pour, about how God pours into our lives that we might live full in Christ, to pour into the lives of others, and about how this generation needs Jesus. This generation needs Jesus, followers of Jesus who are gonna live for Jesus and impact this generation for Jesus. And we're excited to be in this series together. Uh, today, we're gonna be looking at how we pour into the lives of others. We're going to be in the Gospel of John. So if you have a Bible, you can turn to the Gospel of John. We're going to be looking at passages in John 12, 13, 14, and 15. If you don't have a Bible, we want to make a Bible available to you. We have a room we pray for people in after the gathering called the altar room. And if you need prayer today, come to the altar room after the gathering. Our team will be ready to pray with you. But we have Bibles there. We'd love to give you a Bible if you don't have a Bible. The church has purchased them so that they might be at no cost to you. And we want you to have a copy of God's Word. In the Gospel of John, we're going to begin in chapter 12, verse 44. And this will set up how we're going to follow a theme through the Gospel of John today. In John 12, 44, it says, And Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. So Jesus declares, if a person believes in Jesus, they believe in God the Father. God the Father is the one who sent God the Son. And whoever sees me sees him who sent me. So if a person sees Jesus, they see God the Father who sent Jesus. He says in verse 46, I've come into the world as a light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. Recently, it was an evening and I went on a walk in my neighborhood and I realized, wow, my neighborhood is really dark. And the reason I thought it was so dark is because everyone had turned their Christmas lights off. 
my neighborhood has been really bright for a while. And I recognize, wow, look how dark my neighborhood feels. And I talked with my children about it. Look how dark our neighborhood is right now. It feels really weird. And what a picture of the culture that we're in. And I was reminded in that moment, but Jesus put me in my neighborhood. And he wants me to be a light. He wants me to be a light for Jesus Christ. And in this passage right here, we see that Jesus came as a light into the world that whoever would believe in him may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my word and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. So when a person hears the words of Jesus, Jesus is saying, I do not judge the person who hears my words, because I didn't come to judge the world, I came to save the world. But he's not done. Verse 48, the one who rejects me and does not receive my words, has a judge. The word. The word. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. So the person who hears the words of Jesus and rejects the words of Jesus, the very words of Jesus, sit as judge over the person who heard the words. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment. What to say and what to speak. Jesus, God the Son, is saying, God the Father gave me a commandment, gave me what to say, what to speak. I am speaking the commandment God the Father gave me to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. Very clearly, Jesus is communicating. God the Father sent him. God the Father has given him a commandment. And Jesus, God the Son, is relaying what God the Father has given him to command. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to follow this theme That God the Father gave God the Son a command and follow that line of of command through the Gospel of John in each of the places where Jesus addresses the command. And this will be instructive for us as we consider when God pours into our life that we might live a life that's full in Christ, how is it that we might pour into the lives of others? So Jesus gives his command and the command he gives is to love one another. He gives this command to love one another three times. Three times Jesus gives his command to love one another. And we're going to look at each of those times and we're going to look at each of the times where he reminds us. So in John chapter 13, it says, when he had gone out. And the context for when he had gone out, Jesus in John 13 He takes the disciples and he washes all their feet. It says he gets a towel, wraps it around his waist. He gets a basin of water. He gets down on the ground and he washes his disciples' feet and he shares with them, this is how you're supposed to serve. The way that I've served you, you're to do this to one another. And then it goes to explain how Judas is going to betray Jesus, one of the disciples Jesus just washed the feet of. And it now is picking it up that when he had gone out, it's referring to Judas. When Judas had gone out, Judas was now taking action to betray Jesus. And Jesus doesn't stop his mission. He presses forward, even though one of his disciples is going to betray him. And even later, Peter then goes on to deny him three times. But Jesus has his focus set on the, the job. And that is to bring glory to God the Father. And he's very focused on accomplishing what his mission is. So it says, when he had gone out, Jesus said, when Judas had gone out, Jesus said, now is the son of man glorified and God is glorified in him. Jesus calls himself the son of man. It was really one of the favorite ways he would refer to himself. He would call himself the son of man. And now he's saying that he's glorified, the son of man is glorified, and that God, the father, is now glorified in him, in the son of man. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. And so he's saying, if if God the Father is glorified in God the Son, the Son of Man, 
then God will also glorify the Son of Man. And that's gonna happen right now. That's what he's saying. It's gonna happen at once. Now is the time this is gonna take place. Verse 33. Little children, yet a little while I'm with you, you will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. When he would say, I'm going somewhere you can't come, he was referring to how he was going to go to the cross. He was going to die on the cross for our sin. He would be buried. But he wouldn't stay buried. He would resurrect to new life. Three days later, he would appear proof of his resurrection to many people, and then he would ascend to the Father. And so he was telling them, hey, there's some things I'm going to be doing. You're not going to be with me in those moments. And they didn't quite understand that when he would tell them ahead of time, but he told them, where I'm going, you cannot come. And now we come to the first place where Jesus gives his commandment to love one another the very first time. It's in John chapter 13, verse 34. He says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. So when we think about how is it possible for us to pour into the lives of others, Jesus is explaining how that is possible in this verse. He says, a new commandment I give to you. And I'm gonna share this illustration. I think it'll be helpful to explain what Jesus is saying. I've shared this now three weeks in a row. Each week I've shared something different about this illustration and you may wanna go back the previous two weeks, watch them online if you miss them so that you might have context to it. But this illustration was shared with me from Pastor Chuck Miller. He's with Jesus now. He's having a great day. I'm looking forward to great days like that ahead. Are you? He shared this illustration. It's called Pitcher Cup Saucer Plate. The pitcher represents God and all that God wants to pour into our lives, which is the cup. So we're the cup, you're the cup, I'm the cup. And then the saucer that's underneath the cup represents the relationships we have, and so as the cup fills up and overflows, it lands on the saucer, which is kind of the point of the saucer. It's to catch what comes out of the cup. And the saucer represents our relationships, no matter how frequent or infrequent, whatever the network of relationships that we have. And then the plate underneath represents Uh, Places, locations, events, organizations, places of influence, maybe places God has called us to be leaders in. And so we have pitcher cup, saucer plate. What Jesus is saying in this verse, and if we can put that last verse back up so we can read it together on the screen. He's saying, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. Jesus is being really clear that he sets the pace on this one. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And when we are loved by God, that fills our life up with the love of God. And when we allow our life to overflow to the people around us, the people around us are now going to experience the love of God. It starts with him. Scripture is really clear that we love because he first loved us. And what we have opportunity to do is to be loved by God and to love the people that are around us. In verse 35, the next verse. It says, by this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. How is it that somebody might know you are a follower of Jesus? The way someone will know that you are a follower of Jesus is in the way in which you love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. When people look at your life and they scratch their head and they go, why is that person different? If you are operating out of the love of Jesus, people are gonna scratch their head at you and go, why are you different? What's different about that family? What's different about that man? What's different about that woman? Because Jesus is saying by this, all people will know if you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. The love of Jesus, it's different. 
and it catches people's attention as different. Because people who are loved by Jesus and are operating out of his love, they oper very, operate very differently than people who are not operating out of the love of Jesus. And it's going to catch people's attention. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, we find out some very important information about humans. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Human beings, males and females, human beings were created in the image of God. That means when you see somebody that is a human being, a male or a female, who's a human being. You're seeing somebody who's been made in the image of God. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. All human life has been made in the image of God. Well, what about the people I don't like? Jesus has something to say to all of us loophole finders who are looking for ways to escape having to actually love people that are around us. In Luke chapter 6, verse 32, it says, If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. It's so easy to love people who love you. People who don't follow Jesus can do that. It doesn't take following Jesus to be able to love people who love you. It says right here that even sinners do that. But to love people who don't love you, that's what we're talking about. That takes Jesus. In fact, Jesus even says, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Every person we see, no matter if we like or dislike them, they have been made in the image of God. And they are a person who needs the love of Jesus. And if we have the love of Jesus, then that means we're caring what they need. And we need to think carefully, are we willing to give the people who need the love of Jesus what we have, which is the love of Jesus. In Psalm 139, which Pastor Brandon read a little bit from previous as we spent time in prayer, in verse 13 it says, For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. This is a very clear explanation that God is involved in forming a human baby while the human baby is in the mother's womb. I praise you, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. Human beings being formed by God in their mother's womb are fearfully and wonderfully made. They are a wonderful work. And praise be to God as he has done that for you. You are crafted by God. It continues. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. The master craftsman put you together. And every person you see has been crafted by the master craftsman. They have been crafted by God, made in the image of God, formed by God while they were in their mother's womb. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them the days that were formed for me when yet there was none of them. Before anyone else saw me, God saw me. Before I was conceived, God knew what day I would be conceived. Before I was born and began to breathe you know, air, God knew what day that was going to be. God knows the day I'm going to take my last physical breath and experience physical death or the day he's going to come, which I'll take that one. I'd like that one. But he knows the day. All my days, God knew them all before any one of them ever came to be. And that is true about your life. And that is true about every person you see. God knows all of their days before any one of their days came to be. And it's very instructive for us when we look at other people 
to understand what is the truth about what Scripture teaches about human life. All human life includes from the moment of conception to the moment of the grave and every moment in between. And my encouragement to you would be to understand what the scriptures teach about God's involvement with human life and to value human life and to be for human life and to be praying for human life and to be acting for human life. In fact, there are two organizations we asked to come join us this weekend that would be great organizations for you to get involved with if you want to take an action step to be for human life. One of them is the Modesto Pregnancy Center. And it might be a great opportunity for you to partner with a local ministry to take some action to be for human life. Another organization that we have here this weekend is called Family Connection Christian Adoptions. That would be another opportunity to partner with an organization if you want to take an action step to be for human life. When Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you, and we look out and see the people who are around us, they have been made in his image, just like you have been made in his image. And they need Jesus, just like you need Jesus. Now, Jesus gives us the command But then he gives us a number of reminders. He reminds us about how important his commands are. The first reminder we see in John chapter 14, verse 15. And it says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So Jesus is saying, I've given you this command. The command is a new commandment that you love one another. That just as I have loved you, you should love one another. And here's the simple truth. If you love Jesus, you will keep Jesus' commands. That's what he's saying. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. He is reminding us. And it made me think about how many times I remind my kids to do things. I remind them once, and then I remind them again, and then I repeat the command, (laughs) and then I remind them again. And throughout the book of John, Jesus is helping us to see, do not forget, I've received a commandment from my Father. I'm giving a commandment I've received from my Father. You need to do this commandment. We get a second reminder in John chapter 14, verse 21, just six verses later. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So the person who receives the commands of Jesus and keeps them That person loves Jesus. He's he's just reminding us. And he who loves Jesus, he who loves me, will be loved by my Father. If you love Jesus, the Father loves you too. And I will love him, and Jesus loves you, and manifests himself to you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Then Jesus gives another reminder. I once heard a pastor say, I have a better forgettery than I do a memory. (laughs) And maybe that's part of the reason why Jesus gives us reminders, is because he understands that sometimes our forgettery is working instead of our memory. And in John 14, verses 30 and 31, we have a third reminder. He says, I will no longer talk much with you. He's talking with his disciples. For the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. But I do as the Father has commanded me. So he again reminds us, the Father has given him a command. So that I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. He's saying, I'm obeying the commands of the Father because I want the world to know that I love the Father. And he's also saying, I want you to obey the command because as you obey the command, then the world's going to know that you love me. If you love me, obey my commands just as I'm obeying the commands of the Father. He says, rise, let us go from here. Then he gives a fourth reminder in John chapter 15, verses 9 through 11. Now, we taught through this passage last week, so it might be you want to go back and reference it. These are all available online. But in John chapter 15, 9 through 11, it says, As the Father has loved me, so as God the Father has loved God the Son, so have I loved you. In the same way God the Father loves God the Son, God the Son loves you. Abide in my love. That means remain in my love. That means stay put in God's love. Stick right there. Abide, remain in God's love. 
If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. How can I remain in God's love? He just told us. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Jesus is saying, I'm showing you the example. The Father has given me commandments. I have kept the Father's commandments. I'm abiding in the love of the Father. Well, if you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Jesus is being very clear. He says, these things I've spoken to you that, you may, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Jesus wants you to experience life full in him. And he's sharing this very plainly to say this is how you can experience life that is full in him. How you can experience life that is full of joy. It is in him. It is in loving him. It is in being loved by him. It is in receiving his commands. It is in obeying his commands. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Then we come to now the second time. Jesus gives his command to love one another a second time. He told us that the Father has given him a command. He gave the command. He gave four reminders. And now we see him give the command a second time. We see this in the next verse. John chapter 15, verse 12. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. He's reminding us. How is it possible for us to love the people around us? Well, it's because he's loved us. It's because he's loved us. And when our life is full of the love of Jesus Christ, then we can do this command. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. He then gives the highest definition of this command. The highest definition of how to obey this command in the next verse, in verse 13. He says, greater love has no one than this. So he's now gonna explain, this is the greatest type of love. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And these are not words that he just says and then walks away. These are words he says and then he does it. He lays down his life when he goes to the cross Jesus is very clear in the gospel that no one takes his life from him. He laid it down of his own will in obedience to the Father. He's super clear about that. Jesus laid down his life willingly in obedience to the Father when Jesus was crucified on the cross. And he's telling us this is the greatest definition of love, that someone would lay down his life for his friends. And this is showing how love is sacrificial action. Love is sacrificial action. And this is a very high standard. And when we look at this, we may tend to think, we may look at this verse and go, well, that verse is just about Jesus. Like he's Jesus. Like he's gonna do stuff that like Jesus does. And this type of love doesn't apply to us. You know, God doesn't expect us to give our lives. Well, Jesus had something to say about that in Luke chapter nine, verse 23. It says, he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Do you want to follow after Jesus? If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. That, that's like saying you got to die to yourself every day and follow Jesus. If you want to follow Jesus, you got to take up your cross daily. You got to die to yourself every day, deny yourself every day, and follow Jesus. You know, the Apostle Paul, he experienced many persecutions following Jesus. And there are people who are being persecuted right now in our world. There are Christians who are being killed right now in our world. And as we live in America, we may feel incredibly disconnected from that, but that is, those are members of the body of Christ who are dying for their faith. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. The Apostle Paul, he experienced great persecution. The Apostle Paul used to be called Saul. He was a guy who persecuted Christians. And when Saul comes to faith in Jesus, because Jesus literally knocks him off his high horse, which is where we get the phrase from, he tells Saul, I'm going to show you how much you must suffer for my name. And Jesus kept his promise. Because Saul is renamed Paul in the Gospels. 
and he suffers tremendously for the gospel. Jesus kept his promise, and he suffered greatly. We, and Paul writes about that in his letters. One of the places in Romans 8, 35 through 36, he says, who shall separate, separate us from the love of Christ? What's going to rip us apart from the love of God? What's going to do it? Shall tribulation? Shall tribulation rip us apart from the love of Jesus? How about distress? Is distress going to rip us apart from the love of Jesus? How about persecution? Will persecution rip us apart from the love of Jesus? Or famine? Or nakedness? Or danger? Or sword? How about war? Will war rip us apart from the love of Jesus? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. He understood what it was to suffer for Jesus Christ. And many of our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ over many years around this globe have suffered for Jesus Christ. Many gave their lives for Jesus Christ. We then come, as we continue in the Gospel of John, to the fifth reminder that Jesus gives. And we find it in John 15, verse 14. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. Jesus is the master which means I would be a servant to him because he's the master. So if I'm in relationship with Jesus, I'm a servant. He's the master. But do you see what he does in this moment? He's the master. I'm a servant. And he says, no longer do I call you servants for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. Jesus takes the servant and elevates the servant to be in companionship and friendship with him. Is that not amazing? No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. Jesus is saying, you know what friendship with God looks like? Friendship with God looks like I've told you what God told me to tell you. I've given you the command. Pretty incredible. God's working out an amazing plan in all of our lives. The next verse, it talks about it. He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Last week we looked at abiding, the vine, the vine dresser, the branches bearing fruit. So go back to last week if you want to have further on that. That your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask in my name, he may give it to you. Jesus has given us direct access to God the Father through the name of Jesus Christ. That is amazing. Creator God, master of the universe. We can approach creator God, master of the universe, in the name of Jesus Christ. We then come to where Jesus gives his command to love one another a third time. If he repeats this command three times... I think he's trying to get a point across. And he says in verse 17, these things I command you so that you will love one another. These things I command you so that you will love one another. I think, you know, what is really clear here is Jesus wants us to obey his command to love one another. Jesus wants us to obey his command to love one another. He says, the Father gave me this command and I have given it to you. He repeats the command three times in the Gospel of John. He gives five reminders about the command in the Gospel of John. I think he wants us just to obey. And what I find is really difficult about this command is not that it's unclear. Jesus is super clear. He's super clear in the command. I have loved you. You are to love one another in the way that I have loved you. What I find is super difficult about this command is what is my level of obedience going to be? When I look out and see the people around me in my life 
am I going to obey this command or not? How many excuses am I going to come up with for why I don't need to obey this command with the people that God has placed right around me? And I want you to know, I think God wants to do some work in my life that I would obey this command. And it might be that you want to ask yourself the question. Jesus has given a very clear command to love one another as he has loved you. How are you doing with obeying that command? Are there places where your obedience could grow in obeying this command? Are there places where you have refused to obey this command? I don't think Jesus is accepting any of my excuses (laughs) that I want to come up with of why that person is so horrible. (laughs) And I can't love that person, Jesus, because they're just so horrible. Look at how horrible they are. Surely I get a pass on this one. (laughs) I think Jesus wants us to obey his command. And I think we need to be praying about that. That we can grow in our obedience to the command that Jesus has given us. And it might be that you're wanting some prayer. And I'm going to pray in just a moment. But let me tell you a few ways that we can be in prayer together. One, you could let us know through the Connect card. You could let us know how we could be praying for you as you're wanting to obey this command. You could come to the altar room right after the gathering. And we got a team of people who would love to pray. Maybe God is stirring something up in your life right now and you need some prayer. And I'm going to pray in just a moment, but maybe you want to have some one-on-one time with our team. Maybe you're watching online. I'd encourage you to stick around for the post and follow up with our team online. In just a moment, I'm going to pray. And I'm going to pray for us that we'd obey this command. And after we do that, we're going to have a time to close our time in singing in worship to the Lord. Uh, we, I remember, we got those two organizations. They're in the lobby if you want to take an action. I'll be out in the Welcome Center. I'd love to talk with you. But why don't we stand together and let's pray together that God would help us obey this command that he's given us. Lord, thank you for your word. Your word is very clear. And you gave a very clear command. And I want to say thank you for it. Because you say that because you've given this command, that that is one of the indicators of why we are your friend. Because you've told us what the Father is up to. And so God, thanks. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to have a friendship with God. And Lord, uh, I think we all need help here to obey this command. And so I'm asking that you'd help us, Lord. Allow our lives to be so impacted by your love that we would in turn be loving to the people around us. And God, start with me. I'll show up first in line. And help us as a church that we might be impacted by your love to impact the people around us. And we pray this in Jesus' name and all God's family said. Amen. Amen.